May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it was a few years ago already when I was studying through the scriptures, doing my regular Bible readings, especially in the Old Testament, when I came across that passage that I mentioned earlier from Hosea chapter 2. And that, that just got my mind thinking about all the times and ways that God has used the wilderness and wilderness imagery to teach and train his people. It, not just in, in, in certain truth, but also to grow them in faith. And, and the more I thought about it, I realized that so often God used that same wilderness and wilderness imagery, not just to train or teach his people, but to actually save them. Now, short of actually going on a wilderness, we'll call it an adventure, by camping or spending some time in the desert, few of, or any of us, will ever really have one of those physical wilderness adventures. Yet, that does not to mean that we don't have our own wilderness adventures that we're on. It, it's, a, it's a different kind, but it, it, they can be physical, emotional, mental, even spiritual wilderness adventures. And so, the wilderness and wilderness imagery that God uses in the Bible is not lost on us. And prophets and poets for hundreds of years have often referred to uh, the sinful human life in this sin-filled, infested, death-riddled world as traveling through this barren land. Thus the theme for our series. So the question that I, I, I had to address then is, well, what could possibly be God's purpose for using a wilderness to accomplish these things? As I, I thought of that, I, I came to a few convictions, and, and I'll share those with you. One is that since the wilderness really doesn't have a lot to attract us to it, God has our undivided attention in the wilderness, doesn't he? And since the wilderness is a very difficult place to eke out a living, in fact, I would suggest in many cases it's impossible unless you're provided with food or water, then we are compelled by the circumstances to put our trust, our faith, our hope in God's power and his promises. Since the wilderness doesn't have a lot of big trees and lush, leafy plants it's really difficult for our enemies to find cover in the wilderness. They're more easily exposed in the wilderness. And so it's in the wilderness that God, A, makes our enemies more obvious to us, but then exposes them and keeps us safe. Now, for all of these reasons, in God is, in all of these ways, God is teaching us some very valuable lessons about himself and about ourselves as he matures us in faith and in hope. In the wilderness of life, God is preparing us for the promised land in his eternal life in paradise. Now this series is going to be about twice as long as any other normal series. Normal series, four to six weeks. When I first did it, this was over 12 weeks. And I thought, well, that's a little much. So I, I paired it back to 10 weeks, and I thought, I can't go much shorter than that because if you're going to have a theme on the wilderness and wilderness imagery, there are just certain, I'll call them iconic accounts or lessons in the Bible that would just have to be a part of that. But then I also thought, if we go at this 10 weeks straight... That might create its own wilderness, and I certainly don't want that. So we're going to kind of intersperse them through the next several months. We we're going to come back to this theme once or twice a month as we travel through this barren land. So with that in mind, then, I'm offering this as, as a study to help you grow, first of all, in your knowledge and understanding of Scripture, but chiefly to help you grow in faith 
and then also your appreciation for all that God has done, is doing, and will do to preserve us while we are traveling through this barren land. So our journey begins, as I mentioned earlier, near the beginning, back in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve had sinned against God by eating the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They had despised God's love. They had despised God himself, his word, his warnings, and they had attempted to achieve blessings on their own terms, in their own way. And now they were suffering some of the most horrific consequences for those sins. And yet, God, the very God they had sinned against, is the one who came to them and, and, and issued them the very first promise of a Savior in the Bible. That's Genesis chapter 3.15. Right, I will put enmity or hatred between you and the woman. He's speaking to the devil there. Huh? Between your seed and hers, your offspring and hers, he will crush your head. You will strike his heel. And so it began. Nevertheless, that didn't take away the consequences of sin. God still wanted Adam and Eve living under the consequences of sin as a reminder for them and then as a way of training them and leading them back to paradise. So after enumerating some of those bitter consequences, then we read these words. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim, that's a plural term, angels, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. In, in, in really an amazing display of faith. Adam, Adam, his name means ground guy, dirt dude, earthling, right? He, from the ground is what the name means. He, he demonstrates his great faith in the name now that he gives to his wife. He calls her Eve, mother of the living. See, Adam is demonstrating his faith in the promise that God has just made to him that God is going to bring life out of death. And, and he's going to do that by bringing life, human life, from his wife, Eve. And one of those children is going to be the one who would rise up then and crush the devil and, and undo all the, the havoc that he wrecked on God's universe, his, his creation, and ultimately save humanity. Now that's an incredible confession that Adam makes just in the naming of his wife. But God responds to Adam's faith. God makes clothing that's suitable for them, for these flimsy fig leaf laden people. He made clothes of leather, right? animal skin, which would be much more suited for life in the wilderness to which he was about to drive them. However, God then identified a major threat a major threat to his plan of salvation, but really a major threat to the future of this couple, the tree of life. Now that sounds odd, doesn't it? That this tree that was so good, that, that the, the, the intent of which, the purpose of which was to provide life, was now a bad thing. But it was, and God explains why. See, God knew something now about these, these naturally sinful people. Naturally sinful people have a natural innate desire to want to save themselves, to want to fix what they've messed up. And he knew that in their sinful stupidity, humans would think, well, if eating from the tree of the knowledge of evil is what got us into this pickle and into this mess, why then let's just go back and eat from the tree of life and we can fix it all. Well, like any human attempt at salvation, that would be a catastrophic failure. Because what they would in sense do is not save themselves, but cement themselves in this state of perpetual sin, decay, and death. God forbid. And so yes, God forbid it. It says, 
in the words that God uses, perhaps you weren't, the, the divine sarcasm wasn't lost on you. He talks about this couple who knows the difference between good and evil. They have become like us, like God, knowing good and evil. Well, yeah, not exactly. Oh, they knew the difference between good and evil. <laughs> they had learned that from experience. And they were the one now and not the other. But like God? Huh, not hardly. They were now further away from God than they'd ever been. And, and so to keep the horrible possibility from becoming a reality for all humankind, God had to expel Adam and Eve from the garden. He, you see, paradise could no longer be their home. Instead, they would have to work and toil and sweat and labor to make a living from the ground. And then the weeds and the thorns and the bugs and everything else would make that exponentially more difficult for them. Now, perhaps you notice a little, maybe we call it poetic justice, maybe a little sarcasm included in this, that ground guy was now going to have to make his living from the ground to which he would eventually return. Life would be difficult. Childbearing, in fact, would be painful and would come at risk to life. And not just for Adam and Eve but for every single human who would follow them. From, to, to sort of keep them from coming back, God then decided, I'm going to have to place a guard at the doorway to the Garden of Eden. And the Bible tells us that he placed cherubim, angels, we don't know how many, angels at the doorway. And then also he placed a, a flaming sword that flashed back and forth. To say to anyone who would try to come back, this is not the way back to paradise. See, the way back to paradise now is through the wilderness, through that great lifelong wilderness. Figuratively, but also at times literally. There are no short, shortcuts. But through God's power and promise... He would lead his children through the desert, through that barren land, back to the promised land of paradise. From Eden to the wilderness. It's a very stark contrast, isn't it? No question that, that Adam and Eve were the only couple who ever lived with the memory of what was and the realization of just how far their sins had taken them from not just that paradise, but from God himself. They, they no doubt felt that every day and every consequence of their sin, just as we do today, but we just never having had known what the former was like, all we have is the present, this barren wilderness. In this wilderness... God is going, was going to teach and to train his people. In this wilderness, they would have learned the effects of their sin, but also the very saving nature of their God. A lesson every sinner must and needs to learn. As sinful human beings, we also have been, with Adam and Eve, expelled from paradise, from the Garden of Eden. And we are now traveling through this barren land. We suffer. We suffer at the hands and at the, the words and works of others every bit as much as we do from our own sinful stupidity. We work and w toil and labor, sometimes to exhaustion, to eke out an existence in this life, only then to live in fear that something or someone is going to rob us or destroy the fruits that we have produced. And, and then, those of us who have placed our faith in God and in His promises, we're also attacked for that. Because the sinners who are at war, who still live at enmity and hatred with God, now attack us. The attacks on our faith 
Temptations to sin and to despair are countless, and at times there seems to be no end in sight. For all the negatives of this barren land, we are always chiefly tempted to find or make a shortcut for ourselves. As I mentioned earlier, it is just an innate, natural, sinful desire to want to work things our own way. Don't wait for God's plan. Don't follow His plan. Make your own way. And that's what got us into trouble in the first place, but it's the sin that that keeps haunting us. Now, there are many ways that people will try to create shortcuts for themselves, try to create a paradise in this barren land. There are ways that we do that mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. But I think it probably can best be seen in the kinds of things we like to gather around ourselves. We like to have a house, don't we? But then, we want a little bit bigger house, filled with a few more luxuries or amenities, and, and then we want a couple of nice fancy chariots parked in the, in the front, and, and it would really be nice to have that lush, verdant landscape around our, our little house there that we can enjoy, a sort of man-made oasis in this barren wilderness. We also want then our businesses, don't we, and even our churches to reflect the same, to scream success to the world, as if to say, here, here, we have found paradise in this barren land. But friends, there is no paradise that can be created in this barren land. There is no shortcut to paradise. It doesn't exist. Everything in this life that has been created and manufactured from the ground is going to return to it. And that includes you and me. We are eventually all going to return to the dust from which we were taken, just like the ground guy, the dirt dude before us. Know this about the nature of sin and sinner. We are doomed to decay and destruction and ultimately to die in this barren land. That's the consequence of our sin. But it's not all bad. God is good. God has a plan. God has been working and bringing that plan into action for us. In this barren land, as Hosea reminds us, he allures us with his promise of love and faithfulness, with his promise to lead us through the barren land to the paradise that he has created for us in heaven. But this journey is going to come through a cross and with a cross on our backs. This journey to a paradise is going to be created for us, established and made firm from us only by the blood and the sacrifice of God's own dear Son. A price that he would willingly and gladly pay to win, to redeem, to lead us back to himself, and then ultimately to the paradise that he has created anew in heaven. To this wonderful, beautiful place. But it comes only after we have traveled through this wilderness. Yet it is certain. It really does exist. And that paradise really will last forever. Let's pray about that. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us today, reminding all of us that we are traveling life through this barren wilderness because it's a consequence of our sin. Remind us daily that through whatever wilderness experience we each face, that not only is this a result of our sin, but it's only through this that you will certainly lead us to the paradise that you have prepared and promised to us. So keep us faithful to you, Lord, and, and also to your word. Preserve and protect us as we travel through this barren wilderness. Bless the series that we are now going to start studying. And open our eyes to see all the ways that you have used the wilderness and wilderness imagery both to instruct us, but also to save us. We ask this in Jesus' name. 
Amen.